Thank you so much for making it out on this, um, what appears to be a very cold um, afternoon that it's turning out to be. Can everybody hear me? Am I, am I okay? All right. Um, so uh, we actually are going to present our research for evaluation of a curriculum redesign. So um, I just wanted to give you a little background information about how we formed our team. So um, Dr. Ford and I actually worked on a research project um, about millennial satisfaction in the workplace. Um, as you know, millennials are fast becoming um, a large population of employees in the workplace. So we were interested in how transition programs work um, for our millennial students. So when I came to the School of Nursing, we decided to um, extend that millennial research into satisfaction with the curriculum change that Covenant School of Nursing just underwent. So um, I got Darla involved. She's our faculty coordinator, um, and she's also really interested in research. Um, and so that's how we began this project. So the purpose of our study, um, we as researchers were curious to investigate the impact of a recent complete program curriculum redesign and the graduate's perception of their nursing education and the subsequent transition to practice. So in 2015, Covenant School of Nursing underwent a massive curriculum redesign. Uh, they were originally in four semesters um, and we went to an eight week module program, eight eight week modules um, as our redesign. Uh, our NCLEX pass rates were still really high. They were in the high 90s um, and often 100% was our NCLEX pass rate. Um, so we were not mandated to do this curriculum redesign. Um, we were just um, in the forefront thinking about what needed to happen in the future and went with this eight week module design. And we wanted to know how our millennial students were responding to that curriculum redesign. Some background on our study. Um, the millennial generation currently surpasses the baby boomer generation by three million. So there's already three million more millennials than there are baby boomers. This gap will continue to increase and by 2030 millennials will outnumber the baby boomer generation by 22 million. So they're coming for you baby boomers. <laughs> they're going to outnumber you. Uh, as millennials are entering nursing education programs and the workforce, the need for educators and employers to study and understand how the millennial generation functions is significant in order to understand and possibly impact their transition to work. Um, so I'm sure you have all spent a lot of time understanding how generations um, work in the workforce, how they have an understanding, what they respond to in the workforce. So it's really important for us as nursing faculty and then as nurses in the workforce to understand what motivates our millennials, um, what satisfies them when they're in their workplace, because we want to keep them in practice um, and staying where they are. Additional studies include the belief that improvements in the work preparation by nursing has been supported in the literature as a uh, related factor for new graduate satisfaction. So it's very important that they're satisfied with where they are in order to be satisfied with where they're going. And our study is significant because a student's perception of the quality of the educational experience um, should always be included when you um, do an evaluation of an educational program. Um, obviously, we can sh uh, structure curriculum in a way that we think is wonderful, um, but when we put it out there for the students, if they don't respond to that or they're dissatisfied with that, um, they're traditionally not going to do well in that program. They're going to be dissatisfied um, and they're not going to succeed later in life. So we want them to have a sense of satisfaction with the program. Um, Kenny et al. study, um, he released a study that reports um, an investigation into the degree to which uh, graduates were satisfied with, dissatisfied, I apologize, with their training and work preparation are also dissatisfied with their first job. Um, so what this means is that if a student is dissatisfied with their nursing preparation, so uh, what they get from us in curriculum, they carry that dis dissatisfaction with them to the workplace. Um, we're basically their first introduction into nursing. So if they are dissatisfied with the way that we present that information, or in the way that the curriculum is, is branded out to them, it in turn makes them dissatisfied with nursing as a profession and as a whole. So we often see that if they're dissatisfied once they transition into practice, they're more likely to leave their first job and then in turn they're also more likely to leave nursing because they started dissatisfied and that dissatisfaction then just carries it through. No, I'm just using the, uh, the keyboard. Thanks. 
Okay, so, you know, in any of your studies, you have to have a framework of what you're, what's gonna guide you in this. We actually chose the Don Abedian framework. Don Abedian actually wrote this as a business model, um, like the 60s, and he said, whatever your structure is, you know, if you put that with your process, it's gonna give you your outcomes. Structure could be your building, your employees, your processes, your policies and things, and then your, what is your outcome, and where is it affected at? So we took it as, okay, the structure. We have a couple of components. We have the school, we have the faculty, right? And then our process is actually our curriculum. What the faculty have deemed are activities that encourage learning, okay? So that's gonna affect what? Your outcome, right? So when we look at that, we're gonna see how satisfied were the students with our facilities, our resources, our faculty, and what they gave them as far as that. Um, and so that's our focus of our study was the outcome of that. And the outcome also has um, our NCLEX pass rates. That's one of the things that we look at. How do we identify? What do we use for data in there? Also our employment rates. How many are employed after you know, a certain amount of time after they graduate? This curriculum redesign actually happened and we implemented it in the fall of 2015 but our students didn't start graduating till 2017. So see, it takes a little bit of time to kind of start getting them in there. And that's the students that we looked at in our study. So we looked at the students from September of 2017 through February of 2019. And they graduate, we graduate four times a year. So we had several different uh, cohorts in there that we were looking at, which had a variety of students, um, a variety, uh, we had demographics and age differences and everything in there. So we had to get IRB approval from um, Covenant, uh, Providence St. Joseph. Uh, that was a learning curve. <laughs> we, had, we had to write in our protocol exactly the steps of what we were gonna do and how we were gonna do it. It's like a recipe. You had to write each, each separate thing down. We finally did obtain our IRB approval and then we could start looking at it. Um, so our data collection started in the spring of 2019 and we looked at, like I said, our graduates. We sent them emails in there. And it was just a convenience sample that was in there. We were actually just doing a descriptive correlational study to see is there a correlation between nursing student satisfaction and them going on and getting a higher education, staying in nursing. We wanted to see are still people still in nursing in there. And we actually came up with or found this tool. So we have our method, but we had to find a tool to use. Now, we are not working on our PhD, <laughs> we're doing a study. So we had to find a tool that had already been validated. So we found the Nursing Student Satisfaction Scale by Dr. Chen. She actually has two tools, one for associate degree programs and one for baccalaureate degree programs. So of course, ours is similar to an associate degree, so that's the scale that we asked for. So after reading all of, about her scale, here's how she designed it, she said, similar to our Don Abedian model. You have the student satisfaction in the middle. You have the environment, the, the school, the resources, the faculty that are in there, and also the social interaction. How do they interact with the nurses in the floor, in the clinical setting, in different places? All that fit right in with our model. And so that's why we use this nursing student satisfaction tool. Dr. Chen also found that most of the tools that we had available weren't focused on nursing and they were outdated. They're from the 70s and 80s. So her team designed the nursing student satisfaction tool and it originally started with I believe like 42 questions and after they ran it uh, through some testing and validation they took it down it was 30 questions. Okay. Now we took it a little step further we of course added some demographic questions in there but we did have a fourth section we wanted to see did it make a difference on the millennials in there? So we did add two additional questions in there, so it made our a 40 question um, survey in there after some of the demographic. Some of the demographic we did include, you know, when did you graduate? Um, what was your GPA? Um, what was your, how many hours a week did you study on average? Um, we didn't put, let's see, we put race in there. And oh, age group, that was our big one because we wanted to study the millennials. So we had to know when were you born? Um, and these were all anonymous. So we don't know who answered, you know, which or anything uh, whenever it came back. Um, there was something else I wanted to say on there too. On, the, on those two questions, oh, um, 
one of the questions, we, we had to take these other questions and take them to other faculty to say, are these valid questions? And so we had several of our faculty to look at them and say, that looks like a valid question. So we could add it as a fourth section here because in the tool, when the permission we got from Dr. Chen, she didn't know we were gonna add these two. So these were part of our additional ones to us. So we added, you know, overall, what is your perceived confidence as a registered nurse? We wanted to see how confident our students felt whenever they graduated. And then we also wanted to look at how did they feel about their orientation process as well, okay? Did that go well with them? Is that part of the reason maybe that transition may have been a little bit um, harder for them or was it easier in there? Um, I think, oh, we had, okay, we excluded incomplete surveys. So when we finally got everything back, we had, are you talking about this or am I? <laughs> I think I did. I had 45 um, that we had sent in things. And you, oh, you have that on there. Yeah, so I'll let you, can I let you take it over there? So what I want to actually tell you that this is actually phase one. When we did this study, we didn't get quite the amount of response rate that we would like. Right now we're at about a 17% response rate. So you can see that we emailed the survey to 228 and then we had to delete a few because there was one that did not wish to participate and six did not complete the survey. So we're, we're not, we wanted to present, we presented this in Calgary in the summer, so we wanted to present the initial results, but we also together decided that we wanted to go back to the IRB and do an addendum and we're going to use another method for data collection because we would like it to be stronger. Right now we have about three to six participants per cohort and we would like to get that up closer to around 15 participants per cohort to make our statistical analysis stronger. The initial results are positive. If you look at, let me see here, this is the demographic slide and you see that 94% were reporting that they went on to a BSN program, isn't that exciting? And then our millennials were our greatest responding group at 78.9, almost 80%. So that's, that's a positive. Let's go to the next slide, Dar uh, Kim, thank you. So this just brings to really the, what the next slide is, is what is very satisfied, satisfied, somewhat satisfied. So you see we're at 40% very satisfied, confidence mm -hmm. at graduation level. And then we have uh, 21, that's a satisfied. So if you put the satisfied and the very satisfied together, that's at a 71% very positive. Go to the next one. This is the one I really wanted to show you. Um, let me see my slide. Where's the one? Maybe it was on that. Go back. Maybe it was on that previous one. Sorry. And then one more. Let's go forward now. I'm not seeing the slide that I wanted to talk to them about. One more. That's a student. Go back. The words, I'm so sorry. There's a slide that I have that I was going to talk to you about, and it's got the standard deviation on it. And what I wanted to say to you is that the, the highest number on the scale was six, and all of the results of the scale were greater than five. So we have a positive result on all of those criteria of the questions that we had asked and we have a small sample size. So what we would really like to see is a larger sample size and see if that even gets stronger with the more participants that we have. But this is good. These are good results with what we have. We just want to make it stronger and we would have the ability to run more statistical analysis if we have a larger participant group. Does that make sense? All right. So, on our conclusions, our phase two goals are going to be an IRB request for additional access to use the student's cell phone numbers. Hopefully, we will have increased participation response rate we would like to have 15 participants per cohort. So like I said, here it is, 
the NSS Likert scale was a six is very satisfied and a one is not satisfied. And our criteria all were greater than five. So that's going to the satisfied side, that's positive. And so uh, it says our last bullet there, more parametric and non-parametric analysis can be conducted when we get a greater participant. Now I shared with Darla and Kim that I knew I would have my graduate students here today. So I really wanted to spend a little bit of time. You have seen the process. You guys are living this right now. You saw what Kim presented. We got into the literature. What did we find? That a dissatisfaction with your nursing program can impact your attitude and your um, your experience of your really your first RN job. And one of the things that we were seeing is that particularly millennials were leaving their position within their first year of employment. So what we wanted to look at was this curriculum redesign promoting a positive entry into professional nursing. And Kim presented that beautifully through the literature and the evidence that we found because of that link. The other thing then you see then guys, what did we find? We found a conceptual framework that supported what was our evidence, what was our study that we wanted to do. And then the one I wanted to share with you is, because I know you are all reading research articles right now, is what is the instrument or the tool that the researchers have used to get you to the data to answer your question? So we were very lucky to find Dr. Chen's tool because, let me show you. Typically what schools of nursing will look at is their NCLEX pass rate. They'll look at post-graduation employment rates. They'll look at the traditional graduate surveys. That's typically what a school of nursing will do. Well, Dr. Chen's tool looked at the curriculum, the faculty, the social interaction, and the learning environment. So you see how those are a little bit different? And those variables that Dr. Chen had in her instrument were exactly what we were interested to look at. Covenant had a phenomenal NCLEX pass rate. That was not a prompting to do this study of the curriculum. But there were other outcomes that we felt we would find evidence for if we used a different instrument to measure those with the students that we sent the tool to. Does that make sense? Yeah. So phase two moving forward right now, what we're doing is we're resubmitting an addendum to the IRB. We're going to ask to be able to use the cell phone so that we hope that we can get a greater participant um, response rate than simply the emails that we've received so far. Do you guys have anything else you want to add? No. <clears throat> Um, and so one of the things that we really looked at, okay, we were going to use the emails. Uh, not a lot of them bounced back. And so we did have their cell phone numbers, but then that's another um, area of, okay, how do we send out mass um, texts um, through that? So that's one of the things that we're looking at. How could we accomplish that? Maybe we'll come up with a way for everybody to start using you know, their cell phones as a way to send your surveys out. Getting your sample size up is always a way to look at, it makes it stronger. You can actually say, this really did work. This area here, this is what worked on it. I do actually, if I could add something. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, so Dr. Ford did discuss a lot about the importance of a tool and I think when I was a student I had a really hard hard time grasping why why would I use somebody else's tool I know what I want to ask why can't I just write a question and ask a participant that question um, and the reason that we rely on other people's tools is because they test those tools they ask a lot of people the same question and they get their reliability and validity which says if I ask 10 people this one question they're all going to ask or understand that question relatively in the same way um, I may think I have a great question and if I never test that question and I present it to a group of people um, Vern may interpret it one way and Dr. Long interprets it a completely different way 
way, and I haven't taken that into account, and that's going to um, affect my reliability of that question. So um, when we're in the student phase, um, we don't want to go out and invent the wheel and then have to test that wheel to make sure it's round and it works. Um, it's better to go and find somebody else's wheel and use that instead of um, starting from scratch. So I just thought that was um, something I wanted to add. Do you want questions right now, Dr. Long, or do we want to let Dean Anger go? Thank you guys very much. Um, our invited response today is from Alicia Anger. She is the Dean of Covenant School of Nursing. She is a graduate with her MSN from Texas Tech University Health Sciences Center. So there you go. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. See if I can put this on. Okay, all right. Well, thank you for inviting me here today. Um, I was asked to come and speak about our uh, curriculum change and what prompted us. And um, really, they, uh, Kim and Darla and Dr. Ford, have all kind of briefly discussed some of the things that um, really uh, prompted us to changing our curriculum. <coughs> They were right in that our um, school was doing really well at the time. Um, this was, our, our conversations actually started in 2012. So if you remember correctly, Kim had said that we started, our, we implemented this curriculum in the fall of 2015. That's three years. There was a lot of work. So, being up here just for a few minutes to discuss what we went through and how we did it and why we did it really doesn't cover the details that went behind it or really into it and all the work and all the man hours that went into it. Um, so I, I can tell you that change doesn't necessarily happen just because you're not doing well at something, okay? Sometimes change has to happen because you see the future and what is coming. and if you can make those changes prior to it coming and affecting you, then you're prepared and you're ready to go. And so when it hits you, you are not falling behind, okay? So what happened in 2012, number one, I was going to a lot of conferences, a lot of meetings, um, state meetings. I was meeting with different groups of uh, nurses, deans and directors, and I was learning a lot about nursing curriculum, more than I had ever known before. And um, during that time, there was a lot of talk and concern about nursing curriculum, about associate degree nursing programs and baccalaureate degree nursing programs, and the number of hours that the students were completing to get those degrees. And what they found was that students were uh, completing far more than the required 120 hours for a bachelor's degree to get a bachelor's of science in nursing and far more than 60 hours to get an associate's degree they were completing more than that to get an associate's degree in nursing okay so this was the beginning of the buzz and the talk uh, in nursing programs across our state okay here locally we had some nursing programs, some of our competitors who were changing their curriculums, who were looking at their prerequisite nursing courses and trying to decide uh, really what did they need, what did they not need. They were trying to shorten their time frame of their nursing programs. So, um, and then third, our governing organization, our hospital system, also was having difficulty hiring 60 to 70 graduates twice a year, not just with our program, with the old curriculum we had, but with the other nursing programs graduating their students at the same time. And so it was very difficult for them to hire that many students at one time from all of our nursing programs in the region. So we started having conversations at our school with our faculty and our staff to decide what do we need to do? And it started out with everybody getting involved. And I know it sounds crazy to have probably 45 to 50 people do a curriculum change to have that many people involved. But I am telling you that was the best decision that I ever could have made in starting this curriculum change because I had buy-in from every single person, okay? Everyone was working on it. Everybody 
did their research. Everybody took their part. They divided up into many different groups. They looked at um, other nursing programs, not just within our state, but within uh, our nation. What were the trends? What was happening? What is to come in the future? They did the research and so they got to learn about what was coming. So that was one of the best decisions I ever made was to have everybody involved in, in this change. And so as they, it, even though it took three years for us to get to the point where we could actually implement it, um, they looked at so many different things. What do we need to keep? What do we not need to keep? How can we integrate? Can we decrease hours? What's repetitive? Are there some things that do need to be repetitive? Uh, they asked a million and five questions and developed this wonderful, beautiful curriculum. So when we started this uh, curriculum change, our pass rates at the time, our NCLEX pass rates, were in the, the low 90 percentile range. Our graduation rates were uh, 85 percentile range and our employment rates were about 90 percentile range. And those are all great numbers. Those are all great numbers for any nursing program to be proud of. So when we went into this change, we, know, we knew at the time that change could actually, initial change actually drops your outcomes, okay? So we were expecting a drop in all three of these areas and what we found by streamlining our curriculum, by honing in on those pieces that were really important in nursing practice today and for the future, we found that really the students were getting through the program much faster and quicker, okay? And they were learning and they loved it. They loved the fast, quick pace. It was a little bit more difficult for us to keep up with, you know, the older faculties, the, you know, and I'm not including myself in that. But these younger kids, they are fast and quick and they want to get into the curriculums and they want to educate, they want to learn and they want to get it done and they want to move on with their lives. And that's exactly what happened. So they came into this curriculum and it was fast and quick. And the very first cohort we had was an amazing cohort that we had because they gave us feedback the entire time. Every module along the way, they gave us feedback about what we can improve and how we can make things better. And so it was really nice to have that cohort. We were very thankful to have that cohort. One of the biggest things that um, they talked about from one module to the next was the consistency in paperwork. Consistency in paperwork, which we were always so used to, just doing whatever paperwork we needed for whatever semester and assignments that we had. And what we found was that because this curriculum was so fast and so quick and it was moving quickly, that the change, the small changes that we didn't think anything about in a semester longer time frame curriculum made a huge difference in a very fast and quick paced curriculum. And so that was one thing that we worked again as a group, as a school, to decide on what's the paperwork that we're gonna use for certain things such as nursing assessment. This is the same paperwork. For medication administration, this is the same paperwork. We're gonna use this throughout the entire curriculum. So what we thought, even calendars, what calendars look like for each module or syllabi for each module never mattered before, but it mattered in this fast, quick paced curriculum. So, um, as time has gone on, there have been more changes that have come about. And that's the thing about nursing, that's the thing about healthcare, and that's also the thing about um, nursing education. We kind of have to predict what's coming in the, f in the future and what we're looking at. And we have to try to incorporate those new things into our education so that when our students graduate in two years, they're gonna be ready to practice in two years. So we are always having to revise and update our curriculums and when the feedback that we get from our students and from our communities of interest and our governing organization and the people that we work with is, is um, highly valuable to us. And so I'm um, really excited about where we are, what we're doing and where we're headed because there are more changes to come and more things that we need to um, address in the near future. So. This is really exciting as well too. I'm super excited about this study and I do hope that we are able to get more of our students to participate in this. So I'd like to talk to y'all about some more ideas on how maybe we can get some more of our graduates to want to participate in this as well too. So, um, cause yeah, it'd be really great for the students to 
validate that this curriculum was a really good curriculum for them and they enjoyed it while they were here. So, is there anything else? Would you like me to share? No? Okay. Do you guys have any questions for us? Is there a certain time frame that you're looking at? When we submitted in the spring of 2019, we had included the February of 2019. So there were some students who had just graduated, but there were some, it had been a little while. And so that's another thing we'll look at when we get our data is, did it make a difference the longer they were out? Were they more satisfied saying they were more satisfied the closer it was to graduation versus the far, further away? So um, right now we've just sent it out just at one time and that's what we'll do again. Good question. And we did, um, I don't think we talked to our I don't think we addressed this, but we did leave out, um, I think the first, the very first one, the very first one so the group that, that answered all the questions and was part of that very first change, um, we left them out because we knew that with that first group that goes through, there's, there were going to be a ton of changes as things were streamlined, um, and we knew that. And so we wanted to ask people who had experienced the curriculum that had been complete and updated with minimal changes. So uh, we neglected that, but that was something as well. Any, Any other, other questions? questions? Yes, Dr. Mom. Did you talk at all about using social media to increase your response rate since your target population is millennial? So, um, yes, I actually did. Um, I'm actually going to be stepping away from the study because I'm working on my PhD and life is hectic and crazy and I'm doing my own thing right now. But um, I did. we did talk about, because they were going to do um, cell phone numbers and, and submit it that way, but SurveyMonkey is a little weird about that and, and our cell phones are obviously a protected commodity, especially now that everybody's trying to sell me an extended warranty on my car. So um, people are very, very um, conscious about what comes through on their cell phone. Um, so I did talk to Darla and moving forward about using our Covenant School of Nursing website um, to use as a, as a means to get that survey out. Um, and also the, the LCU website because um, there are students that are on social media and that's a really good way um, to reach out to the millennial generation of students and get their responses. So there are a lot of people doing that? Yes. And a question for Dean Anger, and that is, um, it seems like this was a tremendous leadership learning experience for you. And I just wondered if you had thought about trying to do an editorial or a column that might share some of these huge takeaways that you have from a leadership standpoint. It sounds like there's a need for that, um, that all these details, the, I guess the ripple out, like in quantum uh, physics, one change here creates all these changes, and have you thought about trying to share that with others or present it in a way I think it would really be beneficial to others that are trying to lead change? That, that would, would be, be a great idea. idea. And with a little bit of help, I'm sure I could do that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. I think that that would be really, really worthwhile. Do we have, do we have any uh, Singapore Tall International? Presenters, but Dr. Ford, Darla, several have presented in here. Anybody else in here? Then at that level, because uh, that might be a good, I think would really be a good topic. Mm -hmm. Something that would be a benefit. What Dean hasn't tried to make some major change and learn so much, uh, you know, mm -hmm. uh, from all the details that you really weren't sure. anticipating that it affected. Right. And yeah. I've, discussed I've discussed that, that several times, times with Dr. Ford and with you as well over the over the past and I just we just I just get busy we just get busy with what's happening and I, I forget and I move on so thank you for bringing it back up to me because it really I really do need to share mm -hmm. I just want to say uh, talking about how busy Dean Anger is I just have to brag on them a minute they started an LVN to RN track they you know did focus groups and looked at the LVNs of the area what would it take and they designed a program where they could still work and go to school and get their LVN. And it has been an overwhelming success. They had like 96 um, applicants for a seat of 24 in the September class. So they've added two more in the spring. They've also started a monitor tech course. 
and they've also started a CNA. So this woman is very busy, and it's just having wonderful outcomes. But I just would second what Dr. Long says is, is uh, those three years when you were leading your faculty, that was just such a challenge because guys, if you think about people's reaction to change, Dean Anger saw them all. The person that digs their heels in, you know, like a tick in a dog, you know, or, well, that's a West Texas colloquium, sorry. <laughs> um, also to the point when you study change, people leave, right? And Dean Anger had people to leave. So she had all of those, you know, behavioral responses that you guys read about in response to change, she lived them and experienced them. So I just would second that. I think it'd be a, a phenomenal thing to, to try to write up and to publish, you know, so other people could see because uh, it was it was a major thing to go from a really antiquated curriculum that was good and was working, but man, it's streamlined now. I think they laughed and said that nursing curriculum, we just keep throwing in stuff and throwing in, but we never took anything out. Yeah. Anybody else want to say something? Any more questions? Yeah. You know, all of our audience, uh, we're all used to working in teams, pretty much. But not ever, a few in here have had the experience of, talk to us about what it was like to work on a team on a scientific project and how you combined your different talents to kind of make all this come to life. Because it's, that's a very important aspect when you're thinking about trying to do a project. Everybody doesn't have to have the same skill set. Can you talk to the group about that? Um, so I think first thing is that you have to admit what your strengths and weaknesses are to your team members um, and then work off of those. Like Dr. Ford is a brilliant writer. She can write pages of stuff in a very short amount of time. And Darla is excellent at finding, she found our tool, she found our framework, um, and then I kept us organized. I was our, our task master, I sent out our appointments, I um, started the IRB application. So it was just about finding our strengths and, and working to those strengths. Um, and then holding each other accountable to deadlines and, and all of that good stuff. So. Uh, we got to choose this team, and sometimes you don't always get to choose, um, and so it's important to just be honest and to know what your strengths and weaknesses are and, and face those. Do you want to add something no, to that? that? exactly what I was going to say. Dr. I agree, I agree. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, Kim is at the point of dissertation, and <clears throat> people always told me when I started my doctorate, just get that paper done because about 50% of people do not finish that dissertation. So we are sad that she's stepping off of the project, but we completely understand that her focus now is going to be finishing that paper and going on strong for her PhD. And Darla and I, well, all three of us are very interested in the project, but Darla and I are planning to carry on. Darla is also very busy with her DMP, but she, she uh, has felt like she could still participate in the study and we can still go on, okay? Do you want to say anything? And uh, Rebecca had a question. Well, so for a novice, talk to us a little bit about that process. You have your question. You have your, how are you, how do you, how do you go then to the next step? Was it a conversation over coffee? Was it a, you know, um, so we're finding this. Because I have read some articles on uh, first six months uh, of uh, new nurses, you know, just leaving the profession altogether. Mm -hmm. But in all of the articles I've read, I never had anything that tied in dissatisfaction with their academic process. So talk to me about how you came up with that. So because we were looking at, I mean, of course, the first thing you have to do is, is form your question. Um, because your question without your question, there's no basis for your study. You're just all over the place. Like you can have an idea, but until you get that question and you really define what you want to know, um, you can be all over the place. So for us, we were specifically looking at millennial satisfaction in nursing curriculum. So when we pulled that, um, we were able to tie in information about their nursing curriculum, and that satisfaction was what prompted us to find articles that said, yeah, if a, nurse is, if a student is dissatisfied in their curriculum, then they're dissatisfied 
in their first job. So that's kind of where that comes in. So it's, it's about that question and knowing that and then being able to put those um, defining properties into your search um, so that you can do a literature search. And I, as a student, I will admit, um, the Borlean phrases were never my friend. I could never figure out how to use and or or. I was like, I don't even know why, I'll just click all of these things. Um, but once I started um, really doing, like really delving into to doing literature searches, those things are my best friend now because you can, when you use and, it's I want to know this and this. So I want to look at nursing students and I want to look at satisfaction. And then that or helps you if you're like, I want to look at nursing students um, or I want to look at um, LVN graduates. That's not really what I'm looking at, but, but an example. Um, and this phrase over here. So um, learning how to use those phrases will really help you. Um, and, and don't be afraid to look outside a little bit. So if you're looking at, at you know, your transition, um, don't be afraid to go back a little bit and look at, okay, well, were they satisfied here? Um, and, and I think that helps as well. Yes, of course. I think that in research class we've talked to you about how uh, ideas or why there, there's trends in nursing and maybe they're not ab uh, abundant in the nursing literature. But when Kim and I did our study, we were seeing that the millennials were not staying in the workplace, that even institutions were hiring millennial specialists to try to retain the millennial generation because baby boomers are going to retire. Who's going to take care of all of us? So that kind of prompted the initial idea of satisfaction of the millennial generation. And then uh, by Kim's searching, she was able to find that resource where they had done the study that linked the uh, dissatisfaction with their educational process to the dissatisfaction with their first job. And so we begin to go with that and try to find more evidence in linking because it fit with our study. If these covenant graduates were satisfied with their educational process, we had a better chance of them staying in their first position as a professional nurse. You're welcome. A novice. <laughs> to be able to come up with an idea like that and a thought and to take it to that level is, is um, very impressive. I think the research will be ongoing. Mm -hmm. You know, we have it here, but it will be ongoing on retention of millennials and, um, you know, educating. You know, like Dean Anger says, there's new things on the horizon. So we just have to keep on top of things and looking to the future. And be ready. Yes. Thank you. And, and as, as a novice, novice you only have um, one direction to go, and that's up. So. <laughs> also remember that everybody's a novice in something. Yes. <laughs> it's really the truth. That's the way yeah. to look at it, rather okay. than thinking of yourself. You just think, I'm a novice at this, but they're a novice at that. Yeah. So we're all okay. novices. Yes. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. So I know you guys have like a little bullet point on it, but. Did you guys look really into like their satisfaction versus continuing their education going on for their bachelor's and their master's? Yes, yes. one of our, our questions, questions was um, did you return to school? because we did want to know um, how many of them actually. Uh, ironically, I think what we originally wanted to look at was the bridge program, because we do have a bridge between Covenant um, that helps a student get right into LCU and get their bachelor's degree. So that was originally our idea, but then pulling from what we did with millennials, we decided then to focus on their satisfaction. Eventually, hopefully, the project will move into that bridge program and satisfaction with the bridge. Um, we did ask where they were if they went back to school, and I, our response rate, 80 percent, um, did actually go back to school. Now, we didn't ask them how satisfied they were with that extended education, because that's not really where our focus was. Other questions? Okay. Well, thank you so much for listening. Thank you.